Well, the scripture reading for today comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And we are going to have an alternate reading, which means that I'll read the first verse. We'll all respond together with the verse after that. And we'll keep going back and forth until the end. So please stand as able once you've found the scripture, if you want to look in a pew Bible or once you're ready, because uh, the scripture will be behind me. So again, that's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, friends, uh, we are in part three of uh, our sermon series on rise and this idea that, yes, Jesus is risen and he rose to give us true life, that we are called to rise with them. And so we've been talking about what that means. So last week we talked about living a meaningful life um, and, and, and the different elements that go into that. If you've missed any part of the sermon series, you can go to our uh, website, um, www w.livinggraceministry.org, and uh, th there's a list of sermons there that you can get caught up on. Um, but, you know, today I wanted to talk about particularly um, how we can really dig into the meaning that God has for us, particularly with love. And so today's sermon is titled, When We Stoop, Love Rises. Remember last week we talked about uh, this movie, uh, The Dark Knight Rises, and we talked about like how Hollywood is really fascinated with the word rise. And, you know, afterwards, uh, during the fellowship time, uh, me and some other folks were just talking about all the movies with the word rises that I didn't mention because we mentioned that usually those movies are terrible. It was kind of fun to talk about. Um, but, you know, I think Hollywood loves the, the word rise because it evokes power. It, it evokes something, you know, very strong, you know, kind of coming into yourself, realizing your full potential. You know, it's very much like, you know, made to the uh, uh, American story that we all love so much, that you started from humble beginnings and then you rise into your power, you know? And so we have this image behind me, you know, the dark night rises. And so you see, you know, Batman standing strong, Batman coming into his full purpose, right? Um, and so friends, you know, the, the sermon title today is going to kind of stand in contrary to maybe the world thinks of rising. Because I think when um, the Bible talks about rising, when the Bible talks about us reaching our full potential, it actually doesn't talk about coming into our full power, but it talks about becoming weak. It talks about us emptying ourselves of our power. And rising for Jesus, you know, before the resurrection, it looked like this rising on the cross, being naked, being humiliated, being laid bare before the world. And so that is rising for Jesus, is that he actually makes himself very low. And so when we say we stoop, it means that we learn to make ourselves low. And, and when I say that, um, even just saying that, it, it, it sounds a little odd, because what I'm really talking about today and what the Bible talks about is um, this concept that we call the incarnation. So you might see uh, in that word, the incarnation, 
um, that, that root carn, that's where you get carnivore or carna asada, you know, uh, the, the carnivore, a, a, a meat eater, right? So you see that, that word uh, flesh, meat. And so uh, what that means is that Jesus, when he incarnated, it means that he became like us. He left his power, he left all the things of him. Um, in some ways, he held on to those things, but in other ways, he was willing to enter another person's world, to take on their flesh, right, and to become like us. And so, friends, um, you know, what we see from Jesus is that, um, you know, Jesus was willing to do this. God is calling us to do this. And the point that I want to make, uh, that I really want to drive home today, is that for us to love well, for our love to really rise and to be the thing of beauty that it's supposed to be, you must be willing to incarnate with someone else. So friends, um, you know, I, I want to talk to you uh, about um, Martin Luther King Jr. So three days ago, April 16th, uh, was the uh, 50, uh, I believe the 52nd anniversary of a very famous letter that he wrote called, uh, that we've come to call uh, the letter from uh, Birmingham jail. And so this was written, obviously, when Martin Luther King Jr. was imprisoned for his nonviolent protests in the city of Birmingham. And so while he was down there, uh, the civil authorities started cracking down more on these sorts of nonviolent public protests. And so um, Martin Luther King Jr. and several of the other uh, leaders and people who were involved in this were arrested, and they were treated very, very poorly as they were brought to jail. Um, and so... Uh, this letter came about because somebody snuck him uh, a newspaper that uh, had an article that was written by eight white religious leaders that was called A Call for Unity. And what they said is that, um, you know, people need to, uh, you know, really kind of come together. And what they were talking about is they were denouncing Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and the other activists, their nonviolent protests, and they were saying, you need to be patient, that was the main thing. And so um, this letter that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in response has become one of the, uh, it has become kind of a classic in American literature. But I wanted to read a, a portion of this letter because I think you're gonna see, uh, you're gonna see kind of a call to incarnate in this. And so, um, you know, this is in Martin Luther King Jr.'s words. This is not Pastor Steve talking but this is Martin Luther King Jr. And so um, he says, uh, perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when, ha when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters. When you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who's asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you're humiliated by day, day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. 
What is Martin Luther King Jr. doing in, in this letter? What he's doing and what he's trying to invite these white religious leaders to do, and anyone who maybe feels like them, is to walk in his shoes, to see life through his lens, uh, through his eyes. And so, you know, there's this saying that people say, um, you know, don't judge me until you walked a mile in my shoes, right? You've heard that before. And friends, you know, there's this great need for us to have compassion. And, you know, I think that letter um, still speaks very powerfully in this world today because you still see a lot of racial conflict, right? We've seen a lot of the stuff with the police and how people have been mistreated and how black people have been gunned down even though uh, they have been unarmed. And you see a lot of people, especially people who are not black, let's be honest, who are saying, hey, you know, wh why don't you just cooperate with the police and then this would never happen. You see a, a great lack of compassion. And friends, um, in this particular case, this is something that's really broken my heart, but I have to admit that that's not always my reaction. And for many of us, and I wanna say this, friends, that when we're talking about incarnation, we're talking about loving well, we're talking about empathizing with someone, taking on their flesh, taking on their perspective, and seeing life through their lens. And I wanna say that this does not come naturally. And so I, I wanna share a story just from my life where I failed to be empathetic. Um, so, uh, I was watching the Oscars uh, from this past year, and um, at the end of the Oscars, so the very last award that was given was the award for Best Picture, and Sean Penn was the presenter. I don't know if you guys saw this, but, or remember this, but Sean Penn was uh, announcing the winner, and the winner uh, was Birdman, and the person who uh, won the award, or the director of that movie, um, happens to be... Uh, it, Mexican-American. And so when he was reading that award, um, and when he announced it, he said, you know, who gave this guy a green card, right? Like when, when he, he announced it. And then he said, Birdman's the winner, right? And so a lot of people on social media were very hurt by that. What they didn't know was, or maybe some people knew this, but um, Sean Penn is actually really good friends with the director. But still, you know, it was a kind of an insensitive comment. And I, I remember, um, you know, when I saw the outrage that was on social media where people were like, really, you're going to make a green card joke when immigration is such a, a it's such a, a, a very heated, you know, point of debate for a lot of people. It just, it really hits too close to home. You know, it was just kind of in bad taste. And there was a lot of people, especially Latinos, who were very, very hurt by this comment. My first reaction to this was, it's just a joke. Stop being so sensitive. Get over it. You know, come on, it's just a joke. So friends, what, what you've learned so far, what just as we've been talking about, you know, walking a, a mile in someone else's shoes, seeing things from their perspective, was that very empathetic of me, of Pastor Steve, to think that? No. You know, and, and that's not the default reaction for a lot of us, is to show a lot of empathy. Um, but we are so tied to our perspective that it's really hard to get outside of that. When I started reading people and their comments, and especially when they started talking about um, their struggles that their parents have gone through with immigration, you know, with, with being treated like second-class citizens, for toiling for years in the United States, you know, not being able to have a green card or having that green card taken away because of fear. I started, my heart started to change a little bit. I started to, to think, okay, I get it. I understand that this is an issue that matters to people. Maybe I didn't get it at first. Maybe that's not my experience, but it is for other people. And so, friends, in order for us to love well, we need to um, do a few things that I think this passage touches on. So the first point I want to make is, in order to love well, we must be willing on to take on another's flesh, to become like them, feel with them, and be with them. And we see that Jesus does this. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We are called to love like him, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so this whole idea of incarnation for Jesus, Jesus was God. 
Jesus is God. Jesus did not have to feel pain. Right? That's kind of what it is to be God, right? Is that you are immortal, you are omnipotent, uh, omnipotent, you are omniscient. You know, nothing has to harm you. What is the name of God? I am that I am. From the very beginning to the very end, God will always be constant. God will never degrade. God will never age. God will never have cancer. God will never know, uh, you know, hunger or pain in the way that we do. And so in order for God, in order for Jesus to truly feel our pain, he came to be like us, to show us that he truly loves us and loves us in a way where he says, I am with you. Friends, this is empathy. This is what we are called to do, to really love people and to enter their flesh. Now, friends, again, you know, we've been sharing that this isn't always an easy thing for us. Um, and for many of us, we're very, very uncomfortable with this concept of, you know, feeling another's pain. You know, what does that mean? And so there's kind of two words that float out there when we talk about feeling another's pain. There's sympathy and empathy, right? And, and what Jesus really does is empathize with us. Uh, I'm, I want to show you this quote by Brene Brown, and, and I want to talk about this difference between sympathy and empathy. But this is how Brene Brown, who's a, a social researcher on shame and uh, vulnerability and different things, in a talk that she gave called The Power of Vulnerability, she tries to explain the difference between sympathy and empathy. She says, sympathy is I feel bad for you, not I feel with you. Empathy is not the default. Compassion is not the default. It's a decision to be with people in a very hard position. And so she's saying that empathy needs to be something that we work at. You're not automatically gonna feel empathy for people in most situations. Maybe your, your default, you, you know, because a lot of us, yeah, you know, we feel pain, we're human beings, right? But your default will be sympathy. I feel bad for you, right? Um, so uh, the, the way that she explains this difference is like, you know, imagine that somebody falls into a pit, right? And that pit, you know, it's just a metaphor for all the pains and difficulties that you go through life, right? You're down in that pit, right? So um, this is sympathy. You walk to the edge of the pit and you see that person down there, that person scraped and bruised and bleeding, and you're like, hey, what are you doing down there? And the person's like, I fell in the pit. You know, I'm bleeding and I'm in pain. And you're like, oh, I feel so bad for you. All right, man, take care. Good luck with that. And you walk away, right? So what is empathy then? Because the, the sympathy is, I feel bad for you, but I'm not willing to go there with you. Empathy is, hey, you're in that pit. Hold on a second. Let me climb down there with you. And you're there with them, and you try to help them get out. So I, I want to give you a couple examples from my life of the difference between sympathy and empathy. So um, sympathy, uh, there was a time in my life where... Um, you know, I, I want to say I was like a senior in college, and um, I, I had this friend that I was starting to get closer to, and, and one day we're, we're driving uh, to campus. I forget where we're at. Maybe we're at church. Maybe we, we went to get dinner. I don't remember exactly, but we're driving in the car, and this brother, um, I can tell there's something on his, his mind, and, you know, he's like, you know, looks at me, and he says, Steve, um, hey, uh, there's something I want to talk to you about. I was like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, yeah, you know, you know, we've been getting closer and everything. And he just kind of sighs, right? I'm like, oh, oh man, what is he going to say? You know, what is this guy going to say? And then he says something that makes me feel really uncomfortable. He says, Steve, um, I haven't shared this with a lot of people, but I really feel like I need to share with someone that I've been struggling with pornography really badly. Just every night, it's a struggle. And I just needed to tell someone because I need help with this. I need some accountability. And I remember very distinctly, my body got really rigid, right? And I remember I couldn't look at him. Like, I mean, one, he's driving, right? But he just keeps like looking over at me. And I just kind of like look straight ahead like, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> right? And so I remember like, like saying something lame like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I know that's hard for people and, oh, you know. There's been times where I've been tempted with that, and the truth was that I struggled with it too, but I couldn't even tell him that. I was just like, oh yeah, you know, I'm sure that's really hard. And, and he was like, 
yeah, hey, Steve, thanks for listening to me. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> I wish you didn't spring this on me, man. I'm feeling so uncomfortable, right? And, and then he's like, well, Steve, do you think we could talk about this sometime? And, you know, do you think, like, you know, maybe you could hold me accountable? And I'm like, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, yeah, no problem, right? Meanwhile, I'm not making any eye contact with him, right? Like, my, my voice goes up like three octaves, right? <laughs> Which is what happens when you're uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah, yeah, anytime, man, yeah, I'll hold you accountable, right? So what is, what, what is everything that I'm saying? What everything that I'm saying is, hey, man, I feel bad for you. That sucks for you, but I will not go with you. I will not walk with you down this road. We never had another conversation about it, right? That's sympathy, and that is not helpful. That doesn't help anyone get out of the pit. That doesn't help anyone feel like, you understand me, you get me. And friends, first of all, it doesn't show love. I don't know that you love me when you just say, oh, so bad for you. Oh, man, that sucks for you. Right? That doesn't help anyone to feel loved. But empathy is when someone is willing to enter into your pain, into your story, and walk with you. So there was a time when um, I was, um, some of you know my story when I was in college, that um, I fell away from my faith my freshman year. I joined this fraternity that was not a very helpful community for um, my growth in Christ. Um, it, it really was a place of struggle for me. Um, in the summer of my freshman year, I was living in this fraternity, um, and I recommitted my life to Christ. And so it was a very delicate time in my life where I was still living in this fraternity house, and, and I, I wanted to get recommitted to Christ. I wanted to be more connected to my church. And um, there's this one week where um, I, I was in Cleveland for the summer because I was taking organic chemistry for the summer. It's all I was doing. And it was very important to me that I did well because my parents were giving me a really hard time, that my grades my freshman year weren't the best. They gave me this really long lecture when they drove me back to campus and they're like, hey, you're here for one reason. It's to do well in organic chemistry, all right? And I'm like, okay, mom and dad, yeah, whatever, you know? But I took that to heart, you know? Like, it was very important that I did well. And so... Um, there's this, um, you know, Thursday night, you know, people are going to gather for this church prayer meeting. So on Friday, I have an organic chemistry test. I didn't do well on my first test. There's only three tests in, in the entire semester, the, the very condensed semester that we had over the summer. So it was very important that I did well. And so this brother, who I was starting to get to know, he calls me. He's like, hey, Steve, are you coming to the prayer meeting tonight? And I was like, nah, can't go to prayer meeting. I got this test. And I got this organic chemistry test. And so he knew that I was really struggling with my faith and that I was in this very delicate time. He's like, hey, man, like, you know, I get that. I hear that, you know, this test is really important to you. But, you know, I, I kind of hear, am I hearing right that, that you want to go to the prayer meeting, right? And, and I'm like, yeah, man, I really do. I really, really want to go to the prayer meeting. You know, yeah, my faith, it's, it's just, you know, I, I could use this prayer meeting a lot, but... I just really need to do well on this test tomorrow. He's like, man, I, I feel you. I hear you. I get that. He's like, hey, how about this? Why don't you come to the prayer meeting tonight? It's, it's only like going to be like 45 minutes to an hour. Then afterwards, um, you know, I, I'll be happy to study with you. So I knew this guy uh, was, was, he was just working over the summer. I knew that he wasn't taking any classes. So I was like, well, you're not studying for anything. He's like, oh, you know, actually, I have like all these magazines I want to get cu caught up on. And, you know, I'm working in this lab over the summer. It's a really quiet place to study. Like, why don't I take you there and, and I can just stay up with you? I'm like, dude, I'm going to be pulling on an all-nighter. He's like, I know, but I'd be more than happy to do that with you. I was like, you would? And I was like, man, this guy's crazy. And, and so I was like, no, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Dude, I, I'm just going to study on my own. He's like, no, Steve, like, please, let me do that for you. I, I want to be with you. And so I was like, okay, sure. And so I went to the prayer meeting. Afterwards, we went to his lab. And I'm sitting there, and I'm studying. And we study all night, right? And he's kind of flipping through magazines. And every once in a while, he'll do some work. Every once in a while, he'll check in on me. Um, and then, you know, the sun starts coming up, and we decide to go to uh, uh, this, this really famous donut place in Cleveland. We get some donuts, and we get back. And, and I was like, hey, man, you know, thanks so much. And he's like, hey, no problem. And I remember, um, for some reason, w when, when we were there at the donut place, um, I had this very distinct sense 
that I was like, like, like just kind of this light bulb went off. Um, and, and I started to kind of remember the evening and all the things that he was looking at. I was like, wait a minute. You didn't have magazines you wanted to get caught up on, you know? Like, like, like there wasn't really any reason for you to be there. The only reason was to be there with me. Friends, that's empathy. That's empathy, that's incarnational love in a way that doesn't come naturally for us. It's hard to do that. And for many of us, that it's really hard because to feel another person's pain is to be in pain yourself, right? And that's what Jesus did. He wasn't just like, oh, look at those humans. Oh, it must be so hard to be sick and be stuck in sin and, you know, be faced with starvation and poverty. Oh, that must be so hard. Human beings, I love you. Yay, good luck with that, right? But Jesus said, no, I will subject myself to all of that. I will feel all of that pain. It's so hard. Friends, you know, one of the things that I noticed for many of us is that even to look at someone who's sharing a painful story, you feel pain, right? And you know how that pain comes out? That pain comes out in a word that's become a buzzword for so many of us. And friends, I, I want to just take a moment. I almost made this a whole nother point. I decided not to, but I really want to emphasize this point. That there's a buzzword that we all use, that we all try to avoid, like the plague that we hate in this day and age. Our generation hates this word. But this one single word is one of the biggest impediments to true love, empathy, vulnerability, all the meaningful stuff. And that word is awkward. You guys know what I'm talking about? Friends, I want to kind of call you out without calling you out, right? So friends, I, I, you know, this is no one person in mind, so please don't take this the wrong way. But we've been doing a lot of sharing in LGM, and we've been trying to learn this lesson of vulnerability. And so, you know, uh, even in our large groups that we have people kind of share personal things through, um, you know, what we call God moments. And people will share very personal stories. And just something that I noticed, and not without trying to notice it, but you know, I just you kind of, we're sitting in a circle when people are sharing, and so it's hard not to notice this, is when someone's sharing something very personal, I see almost everyone has the same reaction. What, what, what do we do when someone's sharing something very personal? We go like this. <laughs> everyone just kind of looks down, right? Like no one wants to make eye contact. You know, we start looking at our shoes or kind of staring out in the street. Don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. What is that about, friends? Right? Like, if we could verbalize our inner dialogue, probably many of us are thinking like, this is really uncomfortable. Right? This feels awkward. Right? And we hate that. We hate feeling awkward. We, we, we just avoid it. We want everything to be natural. But friends, let me tell you that if you want to really incarnate with someone, if you really want to feel their pain, you got to stand there in the awkwardness. You got to stand right in there and making eye contact. It's awkward. But, you know, the times when someone shows you eye contact, you know, and not eye contact in a weird way or in a threatening way, like, <laughs> you know, what are you talking about here? You know, not that kind of eye contact. But I remember that when I was starting out as a pastor, it was really hard. It was a very vulnerable thing, getting up there and talking. And a lot of times, you know, I was speaking to youth, and a lot of the youth would, like, fall asleep or, you know, just kind of, like, like, just kind of, like, daydream or doodle and whatever. It was very discouraging. I didn't know if I was connecting with people. And I remember there's this one girl in, in the ministry that she never really said anything to me, but what she did was every time that I preach, she made eye contact. And she would look at me, and I could see in her eyes that she was tracking the message. So, you know, every once in a while, I'm making a point. I'm like, y you know, you know? And then she goes, right? <laughs> and she just kind of looks at me, right? And I just see it. Like, I see in her eyes that her eyes are kind. Her eyes are getting it, right? You know, and, and so, like, there's sometimes where I'd be so discouraged, but I'm, like, preaching to everyone. And I see all these people falling asleep, and I'm like, oh, and I look at her, and she's looking back at me. And that gave me so much courage. I felt love there. I felt like she was there with me. Right, friends? You know, and so when someone else is in pain and when they're sharing with you that with your body language, you know, you put down your cell phone, you give them your attention. You're not like, 
Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Let's go do something fun, right? You just want to get out of that awkward moment, but you stand there, right? Instead of saying, oh, you know, man, that must be so hard for you, but it's to really say, I feel you. My heart breaks with you. Yesterday, I got this phone call. Um, well, actually, I made a phone call because I, I got a phone call when we were at the. Uh, um, our, our college and post-grad graduation celebration. We're in the basement. We don't, I don't get great cell reception down there. And I got this phone call and I totally missed it. And um, you know, so I decided to call the person back on my way to youth group thinking, hey, you know, this is gonna be a real quick conversation. Um, and I called the person, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And you know, this person's a little bit older that I was talking to. And you know, I, I just, he asked me like, oh, how are you doing? You know, I was just calling to kind of check in and see how things are going. And, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, we're doing really well and all these things. And then I was like, well, how about you? How are you doing? And, and he said, ah, not so well. So me and my wife um, are getting a divorce. And after 25 years, she decided to call it quits. And for a second, I was like, what? Like, did I just hear that right? Now, this guy is one of the most loving people I know. I remember in that moment, my heart dropped. It literally dropped. And so we're, we're, we start having this conversation, and, you know, there's a part of me that starts thinking about, like, oh, youth group's coming soon, you know? Like, I, I'm only going to be in the car for 20 minutes. Like, like oh, like, you know, it's, it's so awkward. It's so awkward, right? Like, part of me thinks that. But, you know, obviously, I know that I'm preaching a message on empathy the next day, right? I'm like, well, this is a great opportunity to practice. So I sat there in that moment, and I felt his pain, and I said to him, brother, my heart breaks with you. My heart literally dropped when you said that. Hey, man, how can I be there for you, with you? It wasn't, oh, hey, you know, like maybe sometime we'll talk, you know. Hey, let's make a plan. Let's talk next week. Let's, I want to be there with you. Friends, this is how we learn to love. And it's not always easy. The second point I want to make um, is that in the work of love, we cannot lose ourselves, but we must show the way to life. So remember our example of, um, you know, jumping down to the pit and being there with someone who's suffering, right? So sometimes, you know, we shared last week uh, this idea that misery loves company. Sometimes just really sad people, really broken people, um, we just kind of rub off on each other and we just feel even more miserable together, right? And so, you know, if we go down into that pit and we don't know the way out, then we're just two people stuck in a pit, right? Now it's like, okay, it's not just you stuck in the pit, now I'm stuck in the pit, and now we're both miserable. So that, that's just kind of, that just kind of stinks all the way around, right? But true empathy, true incarnational love that is in the vein of Christ is one where we know the way out, and the way out is Jesus Christ. And so when you jump down into the pit, there's a very important principle, is that you cannot lose yourself. I want to go back to um, that whole explanation of incarnation. And remember what it says here in verse 6, who being in very nature God, Jesus being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. The actual Greek here is he poured himself out. So he poured himself out like a drink offering, um, and that he uh, uh, did not, yeah, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And so, friends, you know, this idea is that Jesus lowers himself status wise, right? He has the right to not feel any pain but he chooses to enter into another person's world. But let me ask you a question. What happens to Jesus in his identity? When Jesus identifies with another person in their pain, you know, and like, oh man, you know, I hurt with you. When he's there with the prostitutes and the tax collectors, does he become a tax collector and a prostitute? No. He never loses himself. He never loses what it means to be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is loved by God. And sometimes when we don't know the way out and we don't know who we are, we get lost in the other person's pain. You feel the person's pain so much that you become enmeshed. And enmeshment means that you don't know where this person begins and where I begin. 
just, you just start to morph with them. Like, oh, this sucks so bad, this sucks so bad, and now how are we both gonna get out of this? I have no clue. It's just, we're, we're just both in pain together. And friends, that happens to a lot of people, right? And so for us, you need to hold on to your sense of self. Yes, you need to be there with them. But one of these things is a humility thing. One of these things is realizing that for you to enter another person's pain, you are bringing yourself. And so sometimes people talk about like, you know, seeing things through another person's glasses. You know, kind of like we read uh, the letter from Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King Jr. where he talks about his experience as a black man in the 60s. Something that, you know, not a lot of us understand, right? And so for us to understand that, what people sometimes say is they say, take off your goggles and then put on another person's goggles. The problem is, is that your goggles are fused to your face, right? Can't take them off. You never can. And you need to recognize that. When you choose to take on another person's perspective, that doesn't always have to be a weakness, that you have your own perspective, but you need to acknowledge that. And in some ways, you can't lose that. You need to know who you are because you are going to be able to, you, you need to be able to show that person the way out, right? And the way out is Jesus Christ. And so we want to uh, hold on to ourselves, but we want to enter into people's pain. And the third point I want to make is when we are willing to suffer with others, we will know what it means to be raised like Christ to true life. Now, friends, um, you know, some of this stuff that we're talking about, it sounds hard and difficult. And I mean, let's be honest, what Jesus did for us was hard and difficult. And some of us, we don't like the awkwardness. We don't like feeling someone else's pain because the, the point is like, you know, why feel pain if I don't have to? And what a lot of us misunderstand is that we think that the whole point of life is to not be in pain, to be comfortable, right? And so we've talked about this before. And that's why we hate awkwardness. That's why we avoid awkwardness like the plague because it's really, really uncomfortable. And so we need to reconstruct what it means to be a meaningful human being and what it means to live a meaningful life. And friends, what we all learn is to live a meaningful life, we need to live a life of love. There's some people that, as we've been talking about vulnerability, I'm just guessing, knowing our stories a little bit, knowing where I come from myself, maybe for some of you, when we talk about vulnerability, and I just want to talk to the brothers for a second because I think brothers have a special problem with this because from the time we are little, we're always told to be strong and tough. Don't let them see you bleed. Don't let them see you cry. We've had people yell at us when we cry, be a man, man up, right? Just suck it in, push it down. And so we've been told, you cannot be weak, you cannot be vulnerable. And some of us, like we t enter these discussions, we're like, man, I don't do vulnerability. That's not me, man. You do vulnerability, that's fine. I don't do vulnerability. The problem with that, friends, is that, what about love? Because that's essentially what we're talking about here. In order to live a meaningful life, we need to have meaningful love. Can you have love without vulnerability? Can you really enter into someone's pain and understand them? Because isn't that what love is? When you feel fully understood by another person, a person looks at you and they say, I get it. I get you. I understand you. And I love you. Isn't that a lot of our fears, our secret fears, is that people will look at us, they'll look at all the messed up stuff in our life and they'll be like, <laughs> or they'll walk away or they'll run or they'll be like, sucks to be you, I'm not going there with you. But when someone just stands there and is like, man, I'm not going anywhere. I see you, I see your pain, I see what you've been through and I'm gonna be here with you. That, my friends, is love. And you can't do that without vulnerability. Right? And so, you have to be willing to experience pain, awkwardness, uncomfortability. You have to be willing to suffer. I've said this before and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it, that there is nothing in this life that is meaningful and worthwhile that doesn't happen without exacting some sort of cost or being a risk. Do you hear that, friends? There's nothing worthwhile in this life that doesn't demand a cost or take a risk. It's just the way it is, friends, right? If love were easy, if empathy was easy, then we wouldn't live in a world that has such a love deficit. 
We wouldn't be in such a lonely place where so many of us, we have so many ways to connect to people. We all feel lonely. We're all desperate for meaning. We all want understanding. We all want real community. And we wonder why we can't get it because so many of us are like, oh, I don't do vulnerability. I don't do awkward. I don't want to feel any pain or discomfort. Thank God Jesus didn't do that. Thank God that Jesus left heaven. He entered into our pain. He experienced everything that we've ever experienced. He said, I'm here with you. I'll take it all upon myself. I love you so much. I will bleed for you. I will die for you. And because of that, the Bible tells us that therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We look at that love and we say, that is not weak, that is not cheap, that is not less than, that is love. And that is glorious, isn't it? That is life-changing, world-changing love. And we are being called to do the same. We are being called to suffer. We are being called to be like him, to suffer with him, to suffer with each other. And by that, God will raise you up. God will raise up your love. And friends, there is nothing better than that. Nothing more meaningful. So 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 12 says, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. And I don't think it's just a literal death, like you like going in front of a firing squad or you actually being nailed to a cross, but all the little deaths you have to die in the service of love. All the little deaths to your comfort. All the little deaths to your time to your plans, when you sit down with someone and say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be here with you. And friends, part of us holding on to ourselves, part of us loving well is to respect them, is to say, this kind of love isn't the sort of love where I'm like, I'm going to love you no matter what, you know? Friends, you know, Jesus and his love, it's always a gift and an invitation. So if someone's not ready to go there with you, that's okay. You have made yourself available. You've given them a great gift and you've given them an invitation that they can take you up on later, right? And many times they will. But friends, for us to be willing to love well, we need to be willing to suffer. And God is willing to go there with you. You want to know the love of God? You want to know love in greater measure? You want to have real true community, real true connection with people? Then we need to be willing to suffer with them. And I know that's hard, but remember, Jesus goes there with us. And Jesus went to the cross to overcome all of that. So there's time where there's pain, but we need to continually go to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is hard. Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I can't do this without you. Because if we die with you, we will reign with you. I'm not going to just die on my own. I'm going to die with you, Jesus. I know you go with me when I go to love another person. So friends, this is the challenge that I want to issue to all of us. You know, some of us, you're in different places with this. I I know that, and that's okay. But can we start thinking and praying through what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be real, what it means to enter into another person's pain and to sit there in that pocket and not go anywhere, to suffer with them and to say, I'm here with you. My heart breaks for you. I'm not going anywhere. And praise team, can we come up? And why don't we just take a moment to pray? I feel like with a message like this, it's very natural that you'll get hit in a different place than someone else. That's okay. You're in a different part of your process than me and the person next to you. Your, your story is your story. Your process is your process. And friends, if some of this is making you really uncomfortable and you're like, Pastor Steve, I, I, I can't get all the way down that road. That's okay. But can we at least acknowledge, you know what? I know that I am not willing to live this life without love. I know that love is the most meaningful thing in this world. So can I at least entertain the possibility that I need more more vulnerability? I need more empathy in my life. I need to be willing to enter into someone's pain. And I need 
the love that Jesus modeled for us on the cross. And I need to claim that for myself before I can go love another. So friends, let's pray with wherever you're at and just speak honestly to God. You know, if your honest prayer is, God, this is really hard. I don't know what to do with this. Well, hey, that's a great place to start. Not admitting that you don't know what to do is very vulnerable, friends. So let's just take a moment to offer up a true part of yourself before God. Whatever you're feeling, whatever God is asking of you, and you may not be able to, you probably won't be able to do it alone. Because love is bigger than us. Love is so big that God himself had to send his son to die to show it to us. So let's pray. Let's pray that we can love better, that we can love uh, more fully, that we can enter into empathy, that we can enter into the incarnational love that Jesus showed us on the cross. Precious God, we're all here at different places, and wherever you're hitting us, Lord, we pray that we can let you in. We pray that we can be honest with where we are in this journey, God. You know, maybe there's some ways that, you know, we haven't been doing empathy well. We, we, we just haven't been willing to enter someone else's pain. We haven't been willing to be awkward. But God, can you help us, Lord, to stand there and to know that you love us in all that awkwardness, that you love us and you want to show us how to love better. That this is the love that makes the world go around. This is the love that changes things. This is the love that revolutionizes everything. So we want to learn how to love like this. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.